Our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the 25th chapter. It's the parable of the bags of gold. Hear these words. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one, he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put the money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See how I have gained five more? His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I know that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put money, my money on deposit with the bankers, so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will, whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The word of God for the people of God. Today's message is being faithful. Let's pray. Dear Lord, help us now as we reflect on this scripture for today. May the words leap from the pages of history directly into our hearts and minds and souls where we are really living. Help us to find a new concept, perhaps a new approach, maybe a new way of thinking that we can apply these words to our life today and tomorrow and in the days to come this week and become wiser and stronger better servants for you, more faithful. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Being faithful. The word faithful, the word committed, the word loyal, all of those words seem to be a thing of the past, don't they? When we think about uh, the daily news that we read or we watch or we listen to, it seems as though loyalty, commitment, faithfulness has gone out the window. When I talk to people who are involved in clubs and civic organizations across our community, whether it's Rotary or Lions or Kiwanis or even the Masonic Lodges, they tell me that fewer and fewer people are joining them and are participating. It seems like people just don't join things like they used to. They don't get committed like they once were to a cause or to a, a, a something bigger than themselves. It seems as though we are only committed for a fleeting moment and then we lose interest and we go on to the next thing and then we lose interest in that and we go on to the next thing and et cetera, et cetera. And so we find ourselves in a society longing for faithfulness, longing, and longing for loyalty, for commitment, commitment to us and commitment from us. And that's when we come face to face with our scripture today, which is a remarkable and interesting scripture. When we look at it specifically, I think we go beyond the words to the meaning beyond and behind the words. You heard Pastor Mark refer to it as a parable. A parable is a story. Jesus told more parables than not. More, more, than, more times than not, he spoke in 
parables, in stories, in allegories, in uh, somehow a, a, a word picture he would tell or use to express an idea that is not directly related to the words of the story. For example, we're not really talking about money and investment and, uh, and workers in a field in this story. He's using those uh, subject matters as an allegorical reference to our commitment to God and our direct relationship to the faithfulness of God and how we play that out and live that out in our lives. So let's take a moment and digest the story. We read about this, this master or this leader, this owner of a field, who gives to his servants different talents. Now, when you and I think about talents, we think about, like we heard my young friends talk about, art or music or drama or any of the other things that people are given talent to do. Back in the, in the first century, talent was also a, a direct phrase, uh, a descriptive word for money. So in this case, the, the, this uh, master, as he is referred to, gives the first servant 10 bags of gold, the next servant two bags, and the next servant one. Now this first one takes those 10 bags and uses them as though they were his talent, his ability. He invests them. He, he uses them and he multiplies his gifts. The next one does the same thing. But the third one becomes afraid and worried and, and takes it and hides it and puts it in a field. Now, all of these things describe people's viewpoints, how they are looking at life, how they are dealing with life, and how they view the person that they are working with. The first idea I get is the generosity of this master. He gives this money to his people. He trusts them to do what's right with it. He trusts them to not to hide it in the ground, but to instead try to do their best to employ it and to use it for the betterment of themselves and their community. And so the first thing I think we notice is that generosity and that trust, trusting attitude from the owner to his people. And then we see his faithfulness displayed by then leaving on a trip and trusting them to do what they needed to do. We then look at the people that, they are, that, that are given the money. When they receive the money, how do they respond to it? How do they respond to the person they're working with? Number one, they trust him. They receive the money, and they do something with it. They trust him, they respect him, and they appreciate the fact they're given this opportunity to excel and to do something beyond what they could normally do. And then after a long amount of time, the master comes back and he sees the progress that was made. What did the people do with the talent they were given, with the money they were given, with the gifts they were given? The first one we've already talked about was able to double what he was given. And the master says, oh, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the master. Now, you'll notice those words are used many times by Jesus in other stories throughout the Bible, unrelated to this one. The phrase about good and trustworthy servant or good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of of the master. Another place Jesus says, enter into the joy of the Lord. This is directly related to our commitment to God because that's what supposedly is said to us when we transition from this life to the next. We hope to hear those words, don't we? Even the Apostle Paul refers to that. We hope to be able to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. So that tells us right away we're not talking about money and some investment in some field. We're talking about people's commitment to God and are they sharing their faith with other people? Are they giving from the gifts they were given to help make others' lives better, to help make their community stronger and better and more committed to the Lord. Just the phraseology, if nothing else, gives us that clue. The next servant had two bags. He does a similar thing and was able to multiply his talent, and he is appreciated by the master. And then we get to this third individual, and I'm, I'm tempted, like you are probably, to feel sorry for this guy. Because you think, first of all, you know, he, he was trying to do the right thing. He was afraid. He didn't want to lose the money, and so he buries it. Now, I don't even know how he found where he buried it unless he put a stick in the ground. Because if he buried it, you know, the rains come and the winds blow and ever, whatever, you might forget where you buried the thing. That would be a comical story, wouldn't it, if it wrote in the Bible, the guy buried it and he couldn't find where he buried it, right? Have to use somehow, uh, didn't have, they didn't have the, what is it, ding, 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 the thing that they used to find, what is it called? Thank you, metal detector in the beach, 
or in the backyard. I don't know where they would have found the money. But anyway, he must have remembered where he buried it. He gives it, look, I'm, aren't you so proud of me? I didn't lose anything. It's the exact same as you left it. And in the story, the master is very upset with him because he has not done anything with what he was given. Now, first of all, we're on first blush, we feel sorry for the guy until we read the scripture more specifically and we hear what the guy says to the master. And that gives us a, a very clear view of his heart, of how he is viewing this individual with whom he works. You heard Pastor Mark read it. The first thing he says to, the, to this master when he returns home is probably not what you want to say in this situation if you ever find yourself in a similar situation. You probably don't want to insult the guy that has just come back from a trip and has trusted you with something. He says, you are a hard man, and I was afraid of you. That, first of all, tells us where his heart was. He, was, he did not trust the gentleman he was working with. He didn't have a good view or a good feeling about the gentleman he was working with, and he feared him. And then he goes on to insult him further. And he says, because I know you are the type of person that, that harvests where you did not sow. He's basically calling the man a thief. You didn't put anything in the ground, but you take from it. And you gather, you gather where you did not spread seed. So he's saying, you are a thief, you're a liar, you steal from it. So that's probably not what you want to say when you're in that gentleman's situation. It's not the best way to win friends and influence people, to insult the person that has just trusted you, that has just entrusted you with a gift and a talent. So then the, the master rep repeats what the guy says to him. He says, okay, so if you think I'm someone who reaps where they did not sow and gathers where they did not spread seed and you're afraid of me anyway, you know, get away from me, you wicked servant. He's very upset with the guy because not only did he not do anything with what he was given, he insults and mistrusts the person that he was working with. So it shows us, friends, a deeper responsibility we have as Christians to be faithful to God because God is faithful to us. God has given every single one of you a talent and more than one talent. I know what a lot of your talents are because you share, you share them with us, and, and I'm aware of that. But you might even realize deep within there's some talents that are undeveloped that you haven't used yet, that you would like to, but you're not quite sure if you should or you're a little bit nervous about it. But when we realize God has given us these good talents to use, to employ, to share with other people, then that multiplies the joy back to us because we're, we are honoring God. We, are, we don't have this fear of God. We're not so scared of God that we better bury something and whatever it is, we better not use it because if we make a mistake, God's going to get us for it. God's going to kick us when we're down. He's going to be glad. He's just waiting up, waiting up there, looking down through a microscope or a telescope. Cannot wait for us to mess up. So we can say, see, I told you you were going to mess up. You, you just screwed up again. If that's how we view God, we are the exact same as this, this servant who buries the thing in the ground and then who insults God, or in this case, the master, when he comes home by saying, you're a hard person and, and, and you're a thief and you're a liar and you're this and you're that and the other thing. That's how we're acting towards God if we bury these gifts and these talents because we're afraid that God might not like what we do with it, that God might not appreciate how we employ the gifts he has given us. So beyond the monetary thing, beyond the, the money that they were given, we're really talking about our relationship with God. Do we trust God? Do we realize God believes in us? Do we, do we believe in God? And do we trust God enough to use the talents that he has given us? Or do we bury it in the ground because we're afraid that we might mess up? We're afraid that we might screw something up again and then we're going to beat ourselves up, and God's going to beat us up, and we're just going to feel horrible people. And so it gets back, friends, to how we view God, how we view ourselves, how we view each other. Are we in a team together? Are we rooting for one another? Are we hoping that each other succeeds, or are we waiting for someone to fail so we can gloat and say, look, I told you we're going to mess up anyway. That's what we see in society more, more times than not, and we see people just rooting for someone to fail and being glad when someone doesn't go, something doesn't go right for someone or it doesn't go exactly as planned. And then there are those folks who are just so happy about that. I knew you were going to mess up in the first place. So that becomes a self-fulfilling and a community-fulfilling process because not only does the person look down on them, other people look down on them. And it becomes this kind of weird, mixed-up, internalized thing as opposed to looking outward and saying, God, we believe in you. We believe in ourselves, and we believe in each other, and we're good people, 
and we want to make a difference. We want to make the world a better place. We want to invest in, and, and share the talent that you've given us. And if things don't go exactly right all the time, if we make a mistake or if someone else makes a mistake, well, that's okay. We'll, we'll do it better the next time, and we'll learn from it, and we'll help each other along the way. And then we'll be wiser because of it, and the next time this situation comes up, we'll do better because we learn from it. That's the kind of attitude that honors God. That's the kind of attitude that trusts God, that God believes in you, and you believe in God, and we believe in each other. And when you believe in yourself, it's not an egotistical thing. You're, when you believe in yourself, you're believing that God created you to be a special person, that God gave you important gifts and talents, and it's okay to use them. It's okay to employ them. So one day when we leave this place, when we transition from this life, I've got two funerals to do this week, one on Monday, one on Tuesday. Not from our community, but folks who did not have someone to do their service, and so they reached out and asked if we would do it. But whenever we transition, like those individuals did, to another reality we call heaven, wouldn't it be something to see the Lord there to welcome us home and to say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord, because you trusted me, you honored me, you allowed me to trust you and to honor you and to give you talent, you recognized that, you used it, and the world was a better place. Your community was a better place. Your home was a better place. Your church was a better place because of you. You were such a blessing. Enter into the joy of the Lord. You took what I gave you, and you made the most of it. And sure, you tripped along the way. You made a few mistakes. But you know what? Don't we all? But you, you really kept on going, and you didn't give up. And you were faithful to me. You were loyal to me. You were committed to me. And you made a beautiful difference in, in the world because of it. That kind of thing will be just such a joyful experience to hear, won't it? To hear the Lord say something like that to you or to me would be a beautiful thing. And we can say, Lord, well, thank you for trusting us. Thank you for being there. Even when I screwed things up and you helped me through it and you, you got in the dirt, you rolled your sleeves up and you brushed me off and you got me up and going again and you believed in me again when no one else would and you kept in there with me, you hung in there with me and I was able to do what I did, Lord, because you were there to trust me and to bless me. That's a beautiful thing, a wonderful homecoming. And the way we can have that is to start today, to look within just for a quick moment and say, Lord, what gifts and what talents have you given me? And then to quickly turn outward and say, I want to use that. I want to invest that. I want to trust you, God, enough to say, I'm going to, I'm going to do my best with what you've given me. And I'm going to hang in there with you, Lord, and I'm going to trust and be loyal and be committed. I'm going to ultimately be faithful to you because you are so faithful to me. And that, my friends, is what makes life worth living. That, my friends, is what makes life an investment that doesn't just live for 90 or 100 or 110 or 115 years, but lives for ever and a day, for eternity. Your life and mine can be an investment that lives for eternity because you gave your best to be everything the Lord wanted you to be and to invest your talents as a faithful servant of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. May we pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for giving us talents. Thank you for giving us abilities. And we all have different ones. We all have ones that, that you've given us specifically on purpose, not randomly, not casually doling out things here and there, but instead on purpose, intentionally investing in us what you think is best for us and how we might then apply that to the world around us. We trust the fact and we honor the fact that you've done that. We don't see you as some hard individual who is untrustworthy and mean and rough. Instead, we see you as someone who is loving and forgiving and, and a refreshing presence in our lives that believes in us, even when we haven't believed in ourselves. And you bring us back to the knowledge that you can do this. You are good enough and strong enough and smart enough to do exactly what I've created you to do. And Lord, help us to have that self-confidence directly related to our confidence in you. May we be faithful to you because of it. And may the ability that you've given us flow from us so beautifully that it spills out into the lives of other people and gives them the courage to live out their gift and their talent and their ability. So that faithfulness might become, again, a trait, a benchmark of the church of Jesus Christ and of this nation that we call the United States. 
There may be some of us here, Lord, who are either here in person or watching or listening this, to this worship service today who say, I, I wish I had that kind of relationship with God, but I really don't. Well, today is the perfect day. I can't think of a better day, actually, than today, than right now, to pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, come into my life. I want to believe in you. Give me a fresh start. Help me be faithful. If we prayed that prayer or if anything similar to it, the Lord Jesus has taken up residence in your heart and has made his home there. And from this moment on, we'll begin to help develop your talent and give you the opportunity to express it to those around you. Others of us, Lord, may have prayed that prayer last week or last year or 50 or 60 years ago, but today we feel moved by your presence to rededicate ourselves to you, to awaken to the talent within us and to express it and to invest it and to use it. And so we sign again on the dotted line as your faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. For this time of history that we are called to live, may we hold your banner high, Lord, and may our watch be one marked by faithfulness and commitment and loyalty. For all of these good things and for so much more, we are grateful, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.